So I got six thousand dollars in my pockets, but I put like three thousand dollars in one pocket and like one thousand in the other, and one I, I, I like I spread it out, right? So I show up and I'm like, "Hey man, I'll give you three thousand dollars." He was like, "No, you know, I'll, I'll do it for six thousand." I was like, "You know," so I took out the three thousand in the first pocket. Yeah. And I was like, "Look, this is all I brought. I got three thousand right here, cash." Yeah. So I was like, "Take it, dude." And you know, people see it; it's different. They get excited. He was like, "All right, four. I was like, "All right." So I took out the other pocket, <laughs> and then he laughed. And then we made the deal. I got the truck, and it was it was like manual. I can't drive manual. So I have to oh. have someone come over and help me drive it home. This is started the storefront. Today's guest is Fernando Lopez, founder of I Love Micheladas. If you've never had a Michelada, it's a spicy tomato-based concoction mixed with a beer. Though if I'm being honest, that description doesn't begin to encapsulate the drink that GQ called the greatest Michelada in a city full of great Micheladas. And whatever you do, don't call it a Mexican Bloody Mary. So listen in as we cover everything from dealing with imposter syndrome, making a Michelada mobile from an old VW van, to Fernando's dream of one day getting his product into Applebee's nationwide. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. We're here with Fernando hey. Lopez of I'm I here. Love Micheladas. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, dude. Let's talk about what this is. So people love, people, for people who don't know. Yeah. So I, just, I have to explain this. We have listeners from all across the country. Let's do it. Some have never heard of a Michelada. Tell them what it is. I'll tell them that... Uh, they might not have yet, but in five years, the whole country will hear about it. I love that. Uh, Michel has a, it's a spicy beer cocktail. It's just a beer cocktail. Okay. In Mexico, to me, like the quintessential, the, in the simplest form, a michelada is beer with lime and some sort of rim. And then on top of that, then you can make it as complex as you want. So we have our own two recipes. We have the red that I brought and the OG green. And the OG green is the original one. The OG green is more savory, sauce, sauceful, more like deep. A deeper flavor. I didn't know there was a green one. Yeah, this is like the more friendly. It's lighter, crispier. Red. Red. Tomato flavor. Tomato. Yeah, more tomato but neither one tastes like tomato. Okay. I one of my biggest pet peeves is going to a restaurant asking for a Michelada and getting like bloody Mary mix in a beer. <laughs> because tomato is a blending agent. Like as an ingredient, it, what it does is blends flavors together. Uh-huh. So when you add just tomato with beer, all it does is you're kind of just taking away all flavors. And you're just getting like watery, tomatoey, watery flavor. I didn't know that. Yeah. So then, like, what huh. the, what the tomato does in the Michelada mix is it kind of blends the flavors together, the citrus, the sauces, like the saltiness. What else is in it? What else is in the Michelada besides? It's the, the tomato way you make flavor. it at home. I mean, think of how you make it at home. You have your sauces, your spices, salt, tomato juice. This one uh, doesn't have any clam juice. Our original one does. Okay. But this one also, there. This one has anchovies, so it's not exactly vegan. Okay. We have a vegan one also. You can find it on our website. And how did you start the business? Were you guys doing it at the restaurant? It started from the restaurant. You know, we've had the restaurant for 25 years. When we took over the restaurant, we were rebranding everything. One of the things we've always sold at the restaurant is the mole. Yeah, the mole is amazing. Yeah. So we we bought the domain I Love Mole. And and it used to be the Galaguetza. And we were talking about branding earlier. Yeah. How, like, I don't really believe in, like, names that much anymore. (laughs) Sure. Because Galaguetza is such a weird word. But, like, giving... Our our website used to be thegalaguetza.com. So, oh. like, imagine giving that out, right? Yeah. Where it's, like, T-H-E, G-U-E, <laughs> yeah. L-A, G- another G-U-E. So then we bought ilovemole.com. Once we had a domain, we were like, all right, let's rebrand our mole, put it online. We got on Shopify. I think, like, within, we're one of the first Shopify stores. Or at least, you know, it was super new. Yeah. Like, I, well, I would ask everybody, like, have you heard of Shopify? Have you heard of Shopify? And nobody would know about it. But now they're, like, the household name. It's crazy. Yeah. But we were, so we got on Shopify. And when we started... We would people will would, would buy the mole mm-hmm. from like you know Nebraska, and we would have like five sales a week. So I would hand write a letter to every customer. Yeah. I'll be like, "Dear, thank you for your mole. Yeah. Here's your mole from you know Fernando of the Galagetsa family. Yeah, send it out." That slowly started becoming bigger and bigger until like I couldn't really do any more handwritten notes. Yep. I remember one day we came out an article, and we had 150 orders in one day. Wow. So we had to send all those out, and then you know it kind of like stayed. Not those numbers, but like it was visible. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. So then from that, it was like, okay, what else can we kind of package? package? Yeah. Because you can only get the restaurant so full. You can only fit so many people. Right. But so then on the product side, it was a a way to kind of like grow beyond the restaurant. Yeah. 
So then one day we were hanging out at the restaurant talking. I think we were talking about the murals that we did outside. And the bartender came up and he was like, hey, somebody wants to buy the michelada mix that we use here at the bar. And you guys were making it yourself at the bar. Yeah, we always have. We, we know, that was the OG Brown. Yeah. And we, we were always, we, that was a staple of the restaurant. Okay. So people really like it. They were like, oh, I want to just take the mix. So we're like, all right. Wow. The guy was like, I have some empty tequila bottles. We can just fill that up. Uh, yeah. And we were like, all right, tell him like $25. Because yeah. that's like a ridiculous number, right? Like if they if he wants it at that price, <laughs> then, you know. And it was called in, in line with like, you know, the... Is that a ridiculous number? No, no, no. I don't not, have any No, reference. no, I think at, at the moment. At the moment, I, we thought it was now considering... Now, now it's a deeper conversation about prices and Mexican food and everything, right? Sure, sure. But like we, it was just more in line where it was like... That's the, the margin. That's the, the 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 upsell. Right. And then you get about 10 per bottle. Yeah. So it's about $25. So he buys it for $25. So he buys it for 25 bottles. And then more people were buying it at $25. Okay. So it was like, okay, if these people were willing to buy it for $25. Yeah. I'm sure outside of the restaurant, we can sell a lot more for, you know, a more reasonable retail price. Yeah. And this is before. I mean, there were literally no Michelada mixes in the market. There were no cups. There was nothing. What year was nothing this? existed. Oh, man. Two years before the Cubs existed. <laughs> so whatever that year was. Uh, Let's see. So if Spotify is a new player. This is probably Shopify. 10, Shopify. Sorry. Eight to 10 years ago, I would say. Yeah. Probably 2012. It was around there. Probably 2012. Between 2012, 2015. Yeah. So we were, you know, the thing is that once we kind of like got it, say, to market, the product out to market, we had the product at, at the restaurant. It was there. We made a lot of mistakes that, you know, like. Now I wouldn't have done. Okay, like what? What happened? Like we, because the price was, I think, ten dollars at first. Okay. So we wanted it to look like a ten dollar product. When we rebranded the mole, what we did was we put it in glass jars and we made it look like what it was worth because it was worth a lot of money. Yeah. But people didn't sort of see that it wasn't conveyed. Yeah. Because we we're selling it in like plastic bags, so we had to make it look like what it was. Sure. So we, I, you know, it was like, okay, let's do the same thing with the michelada. Yeah. But it, glass doesn't travel well. Right. It doesn't ship well. Yeah. So already you're increasing your shipping costs, your transportation costs. And most mixers, people are also not buying in glass, right? Yeah. Mo yeah. Uh, most mixers and also just like it breaks a lot. Sure. You know. It's and expensive. It's, it's heavy. expensive. It's heavy. Yeah. Just the weight. The weight's a big issue. Yeah, totally. So, you know, that's one thing. So, you know, by the time we fixed everything... By the time, and we weren't really paying a lot of attention to it. It was just kind of like a side project we we're doing. Sure. So by the time we got this product ready, there were already the cups. There were already those things. And it was like, oh, okay. Now it seems like we're just kind of following the trend. Mm -hmm. So it was just a few years because, you know, we're slow with it. Uh, we were just kind of like redoing the, the restaurant. We were rebuilding the bar. So then at the same time, you know, it's like, oh, let's build a Micha Mobile just to kind of help promote this thing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how'd you do that? What'd you buy? You bought a food oh, truck? Yeah, talk man. to us about that. I, I looked that up ahead of time, and I'm just fascinated by it. So the Micha Mobile, okay, so I think, I forgot, I forgot what year it was. It was one of the last, or not, not one of the last. It was a LA Street Food Fest. I don't know if you're familiar with that event, but we, we participated very often. Yeah. And one year we were there, and there was a point where it, you know, there's so many food events. So at a certain point, we were like, all right, we'll do it, but we'll just take the Michelada because it's easier. It's just a beer in the mix, and yep. it's very integral to the restaurant. So it's still... It's still very much Galagetza going. Yep. So I was there hanging out with the Michelada. My friend from uh, LA Taco shows up. And he's like, oh, dude, this Michelada is really dope. Like, you should do something cool with it. I was like, oh, yeah. And we were just talking, bullshitting. And like, out of nowhere, we just kind of uh, were like, yeah, we're, we're, I'm just going to buy like a VW bus and do like a, like a Michelada truck. Okay. And it'll have like a DJ booth and we'll like have beer taps. And we're just kind of like spitballing and like, you know, just like talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it was like, oh, that's like a pretty cool idea. Maybe I should. So then I started looking on Craigslist and all these things, VW buses. Mm -hmm. And originally I wanted the one with the V, like the quintessential. But the those classic. things are expensive. Yeah, they are. They're Super classics. expensive. So then I, I landed on this one. It was on sale down the street from the restaurant for like $6,000. So I was like, damn, that's a lot of money. So I got $6,000 in my pockets, but I put... Like three thousand dollars in one pocket, and like one thousand in the other, and one I, I like I spread it out, right? Right. You're like, this is all I got. Yeah, yeah. So I show up, and I'm like, hey man, I'll give you three thousand dollars. He was like, no, you know, I'm like, I plan to give this truck to my kids. Oh, there you go. It's hitting them with the emotional. Yeah, story. and I'm like, okay, but you have it on Chrysler's for sale. I don't know. Right, right, right. So I don't really believe you. So he's like, you know, I'll, I'll do it for six thousand. <laughs> I was like, you know, so I took out a three thousand in the first pocket. Yeah. And I was like, look. 
this is like brought. a TV show. Yeah. 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 And I was like, look, this is all I brought. I got 3000 right here cash. Yeah. Just like, take it, dude. And you know, people see it. It's different. They get excited. Yeah. So it was like, yeah. he was like, ah, he was like, all right, four. I was like, all right. So I took out the other pocket <laughs> and then he laughed, but you know, and then we made the deal. I got the truck. So you got it for 4,000. 4,000. And how much, how much was it to renovate it? Oh to man, arm and a leg, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, I mean, the truck, the, the, the truck was the cheapest part. Yeah. The truck was the cheapest part. Did it run? No. Oh uh, yeah, it ran. It ran. But, <laughs> I mean, it ran, but like, it you sounded know, like it walked a little bit. Like, right. <laughs> you pushed it home. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was like manual. I can't drive manual. So I have oh. to have someone come over and help me drive it home. <laughs> Did you know that before? Yeah, okay. but you know, it was just they didn't make any any not in that day any no. automatic. I really love that the automatic. Can you drive automatic? Uh, manual. Yeah, manual. Yeah. You yeah. drive manual. Can you drive manual? Yeah, I gotta learn, dude. So, how long from the moment you bought it? How long until it was operational and you could bring it to? Let me know. It took it took like a, like a probably eight months, which is crazy crazy timeline. But I was literally at the shop every day pushing, the dude like anything he'll be like oh i don't know about this and like okay let me just find a solution just like pushing it pushing it like eight <laughs> months uh, he, the guy was like annoyed with me that's not a bad turnaround because i know a lot of yeah. people who have project cars that just sit i have a i yeah. have a 66 mustang that i've been restoring for three years yeah so, see there you go yeah but it probably helped it, that this was like for your business as opposed yeah. to for yeah, pleasure yeah. is it exactly. manual no it's uh, automatic i was gonna say that's so bad <laughs> such a good story <laughs> No, no, no. That's eh. a cool car, man. It's a dope car. It was my first. It was my first car. It was my first car. So then I'm just restoring it. That's now. awesome. Yeah. That's way That's better so, than yeah. 99% of people's first cars. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> well, it, it car. was it was a '66 Mustang, but it was like a piece of shit '66 Mustang. Hey, man. You know, it was like Still. when we got it. I think we got it for like two thousand, two thousand dollars. Yeah. And oh it was my. like baby blue, so that like my dad <gasps> took it to TJ what? to get painted black. Baby blue must now looking back, I should have kept it. Yeah, yeah kept that's, it. that's a classic it. Yeah. look. Should have kept it. Like, but it, was, it wasn't the original color. The original color is like a like a gold, like a weird California gold, I think it's called. But it's weird. Like I don't like yellow, it. like a mustard. Yeah, like a mustard. Weird. But I'm gonna the restoring color is like an olive green. Yeah. And I, I love I'm, that green. I'm doing it uh it's a two plus two, but I'm changing it to a fastback. So once you're not doing the original I'm already right. Yeah. Might yeah. as well. As long as you're not putting like flames on the hood, <laughs> I think that's okay. Yeah. So then you finished the Meacham Mobile. Finished the Meacham Mobile. First event we did was the LA Street Food Fest, where I had the idea the, the year before. And what did you do inside of the car? Is, it, is there space for people to walk so around? So in, inside the car, so the, the we got it the interior. Yep. On the side, on the driver's side, along the side of the car is a jockey box. Where the, and the, it's four taps, and those taps lead to the side of the car. So okay. on, on this outside of the driver's side, there's a door that you can open. And yeah. It's got four beer taps. I didn't know. I mean, when I got it, I didn't know anything about the car, <laughs> right. right? Like I just chose it because I chose it because I, in my memory, it's very Mexican. Because like in we used to get picked up to school when we lived in Mexico in like combi, yeah, and like in DF, it's like a working person's transportation. There's yeah. caseras. It's like a taxi. It's like communal transportation. It's like Uber before Uber. Sure. So then, um, that's on, so funny to think about. Yeah, it's, it's the same in Peru. Everything's always everything's the same. There's no new ideas. Yeah. So no, that's so interesting. The back on top of the engine is raised. So then on top of that is a DJ booth. So the DJ when he's playing is looking towards the engine towards the back. Yeah. But to fit the DJ, we had to cut the roof, and it hinges open like a book. And on the inside of the of the of the roof, once it's open, there's a TV. And two speakers swing out. So it's, it's like a DJ booth slash beer tap. That's so dope. And like a TV. Refrigerator? No, no refrigeration. The All only right. electricity is just for the electric, uh, for the DJ booth. So but it's gotta, a jockey box. It's a glorified jockey box on wheels. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. So then we did the LA Street Food Fest. And then, you know, ever since we've done like a bunch of cool events. Were you there. a hit? Were people like, what? Yeah, you know, I think in my mind it would have been bigger, but so that was my question goes. was that if you noticed a huge swing in people visiting your booth or whatever at these so be, but because of the truck the next day i got a dm on instagram from um, circus liquor and they're like hey we want to carry you guys and ramirez and those were our two first accounts because before that we were just, it was just at the restaurant that's significant yeah so we got like two big accounts and like at the time i didn't know but those are like two staple liquor stores in la circus yeah. in the valley and ramirez 
in like the downtown area. So when they gave you the account, you had to ramp up production to be able to fulfill I mean, those. We, we were everything was at, from the restaurant, you know. And, but it wasn't like I always tell people when you have a product, the easiest thing is getting to stores. Getting to stores is easy. Selling the product is hard, right? Right. So then, like, we got into these stores and we would go every week to like Circus and one week Circus, one week Ramirez with the Micho Mobile. And we were parked there and just kind of like post up and play music and like talk to people as they were coming in. And do tastings and stuff? We couldn't do tasting because it's beer. So you can't really do tasting us outside. Okay. And it, when you taste a mix by itself, you don't get the full experience. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, try and convince a few people, a few people. And we, when we did that, we still had our own brand, our old brand. And we still had the glass bottles and it was originally called uh, Michelada Galagetza, which, you know, doesn't translate very well. It translates at the restaurant because right, but if you don't know we it, build it yeah. right, right over years and years, right, and we it could have worked for the Michelada if we wanted to build it over. It would take a long another time, ten though. years. Yeah, you can you can shorten that by making it a little more obvious. Yeah, so then I love what you said. So, though. So, you said getting into stores is easy. Yeah, right? it's like selling. Selling is that's hard. That's the hard. It's like the same thing when you open a store. It's like yeah, opening, opening the store is easy. Is, is hard in the moment. It's hard at the moment, you're but open, you don't realize how easy like, it was. Oh, this is so easy. Yeah, and you're like, no one's coming inside. Yeah. What do I and you're like now you got that that's the hard now you got to sell now you got to yeah yeah you got to market you got to yeah. get out there yeah so then we you know we relied very heavily on our social media and making yeah. videos and content and all those things I mean right now we have the biggest social media presence in any other uh, item on the, in the in the category yeah why do you think that is is it just the media mobile it's consistency all the work? it's yeah. the work it's every every there's no one thing right success it's is all everything it. a little bit. Just kind of over like, time, over time and, 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 and doing it every day. And so in terms of the accounts, are you still at the time of this is all happening? You have these two accounts. Are you focused on growing them? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, but like I said, we had the glass bottles. Right. Right. So it's like we have to take them every time they order. We take them ourselves, you know, self-distribution. So like these cases are heavy as hell. So we're taking them and then like we've always had the, the, the powder on the neck. Mm hmm. But we used to do it differently. So a lot of times because of the weight, when people pick it up by the neck, yep. it would fall it would and break. Fall. Oh. So then we had to like replace them. It was just a lot of issues. So for people listening, we there's, the bottle comes with a little a seasoning and it's attached to the neck. And effectively, you would dip the seasoning on your gla the glass. On the, on the rim. On the rim. It's the rim. And then you would put the mix inside. But, it, with but the also beer. the reason we did that is also at the time, it was like, what, eight years ago, you know, whatever time, people, tahin didn't exist like it does today. Now everybody has tahin. Yeah, tahin right? is a tahin is something I never knew of before tahin. I moved to LA. But it's like, but now it's almost national. I mean, now you go to Disneyland, they have tahin. You go to anywhere, they have tahin. But so at the time they didn't, so we had to kind of include it. So this is actually this packaging. We're actually about to phase it out. Okay. It's now we're going to the next step. Without the without the without tahin. tahin, reduce it. That label is expensive because it's a full body sleeve. Okay. So we're gonna get rid of that. Go back to like traditional label. Just do a neck sleeve, and we're gonna pass on. The cost savings are going to pass on directly to the consumer to to, to be able to drop down the price for consumers and, Interesting. and ideally get like a, a wider range. Because right now we're a premium product. We're probably twice the cost of anything on the market. But once we drop it down, we're more in line with everybody. Yeah. Right now we're doing about uh, the same sales as products half a price that are half the price, half the quality. We're going to maintain our quality. Right. We're not going to be half the price, but like, yeah, you get can... more in line with that. So for those who may not know what tahini is, it's like a seasoned salt. It's yeah, it's accurate. like it's, it's a ground chilies mixed in with salt and citrus. Yeah. So was that hard or or like how did that partnership? It's not come really a about? partnership. People so, ask me like, how do you partner with them? I was like, I just buy it wholesale from. And then right. you just wrap it on the bottle. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing on it that says that I'm. I'm not like. You That's know. interesting. I would have just assumed that you and tahini were in cahoots with no. each other. No. No. Well, and tahini we only use for the red one. For the OG brown one, we make our own salt. Okay. And then we yeah, we package. Now we like everything looks a lot more packaged now. When we started, we, it was like in plastic. It was like Coke bags, <laughs> cocaine bags. Yeah. yeah. To clarify, right. like little sachets. Just yeah, plastic. just little dime yeah. bags. I really love the packaging. You can see the Micha the Micha Mobile on the back. Yeah, yeah, it's there. But you cool. know, now the new packaging, it's like it's a thinner strip. It's a thinner strip, so that allows the everything to be just more. What do you guys save on doing that? In terms of dollars. honestly, it's like it's like pennies. But the the way the industry works, and like now I tr I go to store. I mean, I look at my competition and the price, and I'm like, how do you, like, how do you guys make this stuff? How do they make money? Not not just how. I mean, I know they make money. They okay. have to make money. We're, it's a capitalist kind hey, of you know. Man. 
A lot of people don't do the math. Well, I mean, look, at least they've been around for long enough for it has to make some sort of money. Yeah. So for my cost, there's a markup to their distributor, which then does a markup to on the store. You know, there's like three markups along the way. So like yeah. it's gonna retail for I think six ninety nine, but like there's a huge gap there. And I know what I put into my product. It's like quality stuff. And I'm get, it's like I'm just very fair, right? It's just like a straight markup, yeah. straight profit margin. And hopefully everything falls in line with volume where I can then make money in the long term. But I'm like, man, what, like what kind of ingredients must other people be using? So from the Circus Liquor and your other account, how did you then, what was the next step to expand? Oh, just like there? very slowly, just knocking on doors and stuff. And we got into Northgate, you know, oh, Northgate Market. Northgate, Northgate Markets. Okay. And they yeah. have about 50 stores in LA, but it was with the old thing. So, you know, so then it wasn't selling very well. Cause it was like, I think, I think at the time it was actually $12 because it was more expensive. So then we did this whole repackaging. We brought we, we did this, brought it down to $8.99 and then things started moving along. Then we got to Vallarta and we got to Shakey's. I actually have the red one because of Shakey's. I don't know. So Shakey's is like a pizzeria. Are you, have you gone to Shakey's? I haven't been there, but I've driven it's down by the street, it. man. Yeah. No, I've driven I by love it Shakey's. Time. It's like, it's, I think it's like it's, a local thing. Like you have to have grown yeah. up with it. It's like I, a nostalgia. It was just like it was just one of those like, all right, this is like a, a Pizza Hut or something like that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no way! How dare you? I love Shakey's. No, sh- uh, Shakey's like we grew up with it. You know, there's like if you grew up in LA as Latino, you knew about Shakey's. Shakey's was one of the first pizzerias who started who advertised on Mexican television. They were one of the first like Americans like company local companies to really like bet on the Hispanic market. Yeah, and they had this quintessential commercial where it was like a family at Shakey's. And then like the grandma's there and the kid's like, Abuelita, te sabe la última papa mojo? And the grandma's like, gracias, mijo. And everybody knows that. Like if you talk to any Latino who grew up in LA, they all know a commercial. Because <laughs> it, awesome. it was on like Univision all the time. Yeah. So there was always like, my, it was like one of my dreams to be in Shakey's. Because like, not that like I love Shakey's that much or like I see, you know, but it's like, it's more of it's a, a staple. And it's more of a staple and it's more of a, you're becoming ingrained in LA culture. Yeah. And you're being accepted. It's more mainstreaming. Right, because Michelada is considered very niche, so it's like, okay, how do I mainstream this? Because that's the long-term success, yeah. right? You, like niche is like cool, but like, and also you see the way that the U.S. is growing. Like my my pitch for the Micheladas to like people is always like on the business side as a business mm-hmm. is right now the Mexican population is the fastest growing market in the U.S. Right now in the U.S. there's more quesadillas being made than peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. There's more salsa being sold than ketchup. But along with the growth of the Hispanic market, we're not just selling to Mexicans. We're selling to the people influenced by the Mexican culture. Yeah. The same way margaritas were a very niche Mexican product 10 years ago. I've gone to Chinese restaurants with margaritas now. The culture influences the greater culture. Yeah. And that's how things become mainstream. I went to a talk recently at a law office here in L.A. And this guy that was on the Obama administration came in and he was tell- he was telling people the facts about... Uh, Mexico and the U.S. relationships in relation to imports specifically. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that 22 states in the United States, 30% of the income that comes to those states is is based off Mexican imports. And the argument he was making, or the awareness he was making is like in the media, you know, the portrayal is so poor. Yeah. And he was trying to say, but in reality, we're pretty, the U.S. economy and, and states that you would never even think of like in the Midwest even, are dependent on Mexican imports. And he was saying, you take that, you take the media, it makes you unhappy. But at the end of the day, the way he was looking at it is like, when you think about other border disputes that are happening in the world, we're kind of lucky. We're not at war. It's just a media war. It's a media war. we're not killing each other. It's a culture war. Yeah. Try this. And he was saying that, you know, despite the differences, there is progress being made. The yeah, econ- you know, on an economic level, I'm a very positive person, man. I like in the long term, everything's getting better. Do you like it? So I'll be upfront with you. Normally, I don't like micheladas, and it's not my favorite drink. Because you haven't had a good one. That is one of that's actually pretty good. That, that's the best one. Because I'm not just I'm one. not just pandering or whatever. No, I'll tell you that why. Is the best I'll one tell you why I've you had. haven't had a good michelada because everywhere you've had a michelada, all they do is add Bloody Mary mixed to beer. And I hate Bloody Marys. Yeah, so that, that I don't like Bloody Marys. To, to so the reason the reason that's good is it almost tastes. Um, I hate. I don't even know if this is the right word, but it tastes real. Like it tastes like an organic versus when I had them before, they taste like juicy. I, like I don't. Juice. And that's the thing. It's like when I normally have uh, Bloody Mary or a michelada, 
I just taste tomato juice yeah. and I can't stand it. But that That's one, that- it was more seasoning and spice and aroma as opposed to just here's some tomato juice coupled with whatever else yeah. is in here. So th- right now, that's what I'm battling. I'm battling like people's perception of what a michelada is. Um, that makes a lot of sense because I'm always like, I want to, if I, I never get a Bloody Mary, but if I do, it's only for the shrimp and the bacon <laughs> and, and all the stuff on top. The and, then snack. I get, and then I give it to my wife and I'm like, you know, that's, that's why, tapping I, you in. that's why Shakey's <laughs> in my mind was so important because it's like, how do I reach people who wouldn't no- normally order a michelada? Yeah. To get a michelada and also, you know, like be, my, my next big dream is to be in Applebee's. Okay. Not because I love Applebee's, but because Applebee's is such a quintessential American company. Right. It's like almost it, like satire American. But you know what's funny about Applebee's? They probably have like 10 different flavors of margaritas. They do. They do, right? Yeah. There's like they a blue margarita. And, yeah. yeah. And they have 2,000 locations across the U.S. Yeah. So it's a good way to introduce the yeah the population the to something market. that's The general market. And delicious. that's how you yeah. know, to be that kind of like first... It's happening in the vegan community, right? Right now. Where it's in the like vegan? The vegan community. So Dunkin' Donuts has rolled yeah. out the vegan sauce, the yeah. impossible burger meat. McDonald's. And so you think about these huge companies introducing vegan products to your average consumer. Yeah. To the market, the mass and that's, market. Yeah. Are you talking to Applebee's? I've, I've, uh, you've so emailed? The- You've called, you've texted, I faxed. The way I've got, the way I got into Shakey's. into those DMs. <laughs> when, when I got into Shakey's, I literally drove by their headquarters and I was like, I don't know their headquarters is here. So I was driving to i was running to a market and they said no on my drive back i was like oh shaky's right there i'll just stop by so i park and I, I look up shaky's and i look up you know who the person of in charge of the bar is yeah and i walk in i'm like hey i'm here to meet michael and they're like do you have a meeting i was like no i just like stop by and like i'm sorry you can't like you can't just come in without a meeting you gotta like call or email him and all stuff and i was like all right well here's my mix here's my business cards i'll try and I'll call every day, but like the older, a lot of these big companies yeah, that you assume get like a million emails, they probably do. So like their voicemails are usually like how you've reached whoever, uh, if you have questions about procurement or being a supplier, email, email is here. And it's like an email that like everybody sends their things and you get lost. So I would call once a week, send an email once a week for like six months. And at the six month mark, I get a call from him. He's like, hey, it's uh, Michael from Shakey's. I'm calling him just in your michelada. And I was like, oh, man, that's dope. How did you <laughs> like my emails finally got through? He was like, oh, uh, one of my managers was telling me that we need a michelada and I saw your bottle on my on my desk. So I called you. So it was like not even from the emails. It was just from like that one visit. Yeah. And so for Applebee's, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm that's like sending awesome. product and like I did get a, I, I did get a, a hold of the guy once that when he picked up, it was almost like he accidentally picked up. Mm. But he talked to me for a while. He gave me some advice. So I'm just trying to like, you know, it's a long, it's a long game. It's a long con. I would imagine that it, it might get easier the more accounts that you have. Yeah, the bigger you are, the more leverage you have. Yeah. You know, like everything, it's like money. The more money you have, the easier it is to make money. Right now we have about 200 accounts. So like now when I go to accounts, it's like we're here, we're here. They're like, okay, they're more likely to say yes. Right. Nobody wants to be the first mover. Where do you guys make it? Do you make it at the restaurant? We make it in East LA. Okay. So we, used to, we made it at the restaurant for a long time. Yeah. And then, we, you know, we move and now we have our own like manufacturing facility we make it ourselves okay so the way a lot of other people make it the way most people make most products is uh, they co-packing it, yeah and like and even then i'm like how does anybody make money so your your sticker says smorgasbord yeah what? that's the so so i actually run the bar program at smorgasbord tell people what smorgasbord is yeah smorgasbord um, is the dopest food event in the u.s it started in new york and now, and now there's like three or four in new york and then they open up la and when they open up la you know we were very fortunate to like be brought in to help out with the bar. And then it was like a one year kind of thing. And then it worked out. So now we just, I just kind of run it. You run the bar. It's, run every, the bar. it's every weekend. Every single Sunday, dude. Every Sunday, the whole year. Yeah. We close like three weeks out of the year, but. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, there's a lot of foods that I've never heard of. And when I go there, you have. It's, it's probably the biggest event. And it happens every Sunday. We get eight to 15,000 people yeah. every Sunday through the doors. And so that's where I have the Micheladas as well. It's like a Michelada beer garden. It's like I love Michelada's beer garden. So that's another point of contact where I get to try people. And that's where I, I'm there. I'm personally there every Sunday. Yeah. So if you want to meet me, come to Smorgasburg, get a beer with me. I curate all the beer so you can criticize my beer choices. And the way we met, I guess in some way, right, was through your sister, but also through Border X. Yeah. Because you guys use their their cucumber, mm-hmm. the Pinot Sour yeah. beer in the, uh, in the mix. In the mix. We make a, an amazing cucumber Michelada. So clearly the type of beer that you put into the Michelada mix affects the overall taste. But 
Are there some beers that you just tell people to shy away from because... No, no, no. I mean, I don't tell people to shy away from anything. I'll try anything with it. You know what's funny? So right now we're drinking a Belgian beer, a Belgian ale. And uh, and it tastes great with it. It tastes great. It tastes amazing with it. <laughs> Which yeah. I literally was like, this is going to be so bad. You're mixing yeah, yeah. People Belgian think, people and Mexican that. culture. It's- so I have a, I have like a YouTube show that I started. Like, I love Michelada show. And then the, uh, the first guest is my friend Javier Cabral, who was uh, the co-writer yeah, for, for the, the book. The Gluster. The Gluster. Yeah. We, when uh, we're hanging out, and I was telling you earlier, my whole theory behind my video was like, I'm just going to do it. Like, I don't even know what it's going to look like. Sure. I don't know what it's going to sound like. I don't know what it's going to be. So then he was my first guest. He showed up early and we were talking. We we're like, all right, how about we get like a, like a random beer and then pair with the Micheladas and just see how it is. So he was like, all right, I'm just going to think of the wildest beer. So that's a great idea. Actually. So we got, so that's, that's what we do on the show. We just get like whatever beer, whatever beer. And we, first we drink the Michelada and then we just talk about whatever. And you're honest about it. You're like, yeah, oh, we're honest about it. It wasn't good. I mean, the person who's <laughs> that last person was like, I don't like it. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> Give us your favorite beer to pair with it and your least favorite, if you have it off the top of your head. My favorite beer, probably the Border X with Pinot Sour. It's a cucumber, but like, it's like a cocktail at that point because I, I like to muddle the cucumbers in it. Oh, okay. Squeeze some lime, yep. add the brown mix, and then add the cucumber sour Border X uh, beer. And I rim it with our own, uh, it's like spicier than tahini. And that's like my favorite. But the best seller is the mango, which is the red mix with muddled mangoes and uh, mango half by Garage Brewing. Mango half. I haven't had that. Mm. It's really good. I mean, the, the beer is, it's good by itself, but it's like amazing with the Michelada. Why do you think that is? is it just the Michelada like draws out the flavors. Like like the pepino. I like the pepino beer all right. Yeah. But with the, with the mix, it, it really draws out the cucumber flavor. So a lot of things that we've been talking about today... I would consider so so some people view what you're saying as like an educational entrepreneurship, right? And so you're kind of like, I bought this car mm-hmm. and then I converted it and it became like this marketing thing. Yeah. You're not talking about it like a strategy. You're talking or a tactic. You're talking about it like you just being you. So another one is you got rejected from Applebee's, you stop, you leave your product, six months later, boom, you got an account. Well, that's how it is, you know, you just gotta do it. Is that how you think about it? Is that that's how, how you I think about it at all? You're just kinda like, let's just see what happens, even with the videos. You're kinda like Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I think over planning it sometimes stops you. Yeah. It's just what works for me. Sure. Right? Yeah. Sometimes when I over plan things, I'm a I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. So like that's why I used to do a lot of videos. I used to do a lot of video editing, a lot of content for the Michelas. And then like I got to a point where everybody was like, "Oh, those videos are so good." And then like I was like, "Oh, they gotta be better, better." <laughs> and then it stopped me because at that at that point it was like, yeah. I got like a camera and like lenses, and I got to edit it, and I was like importing into After Effects and doing all these crazy things. So like it, I made it so hard for me for myself, right? Where I like now I just don't do it as much as I used to. That's so important. So now I'm going back. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna like not worry about it and just do it. Especially now, the way the the marketing landscape is, yeah, things are moving so quickly. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm like, no one really cares right. that much. People digest the content so quickly, so quickly, yeah. and they, and they'll cut through the bullshit, right? Like, right. The the production quality doesn't matter as much as authenticity. Authenticity is what sells now. I think that's why podcasts are becoming like a because real yeah market, because right? because it's long format, so people are able to like talk enough to the bullshit where they eventually like are real. Yeah, and that's the part that people like. Totally I mean, that's true. why people like uh, like hot takes, right? Because like the spiciness, people <laughs> yeah. let their guards down and they're more real. Or yeah. like even Fear Factor. That's why people like Fear Factor, right? Initially, because it's like it's something you can't that put on away. an act yeah. when you're when your fear of this snake pit in front of exactly. you is overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, it's authenticity. We've been fed like curated or like actors or like we've been fed that for so long it's interesting that all of that's changing so quickly there's yeah. an awareness around everything around food around what you put in your body i mean you look at I like mean, people the biggest people on like social media are people who just don't don't care and are just like just do it who's your favorite person to follow i don't i don't know <laughs> everybody i just scroll like so, uh, it gets depressing sometimes where i'm like i wish i was this authentic or like i wish <laughs> i wish i gave his little fucks I think about that a lot sometimes when I post because I'm like, why am I thinking about this? Yeah, that's what happens to me. I overthink. I mean, I haven't posted anything on my personal Instagram for so long because I overthink everything. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I'll post it later. And that later never comes. Do you have a team that you that you work with? Not for my personal one. No, I mean, for um, the Michelada. Yeah, yeah, we we have a team. It's like uh, me and Christine and, uh, you know, we have Jennifer and uh, Gabby from Camilla Creative. 
that we work with. At what point were you like, this is a real company? Like at what point oh, did, you, did you get to like, oh my goodness, this is like taking more of my time or we have a lot of accounts? A couple of years ago. I mean, and even then, maybe like one or two years ago. It was just... Uh, in your head though, what was what was that like? Were you like, oh, this is this is legit now? Or... In my head, I was like, oh, I got, I'm like, this is like a thing. I got to treat it like a startup where it's like, you know, like day and night, kind of die by it and just make it work. Do you ever feel the imposter syndrome of it all? All the time. I think we all do. I don't yeah. know. Do you? Oh, dude, I was at dinner last night, and this is all we talked about. My buddy just sold his company, huge acquisition. Kudos to He still him. feels like an imposter? He feels like he tricked everybody into it? He deals with it all the time, on the daily. And so we were both talking about it. We were talking about the reality of what that's like and coping is he, mechanisms. Is he brown? No. I was talking no, to a friend but... of mine. We had dinner, I had dinner at my house, and I had uh, my friend, she owns a, a restaurant, and another friend, she owns a restaurant, and another guy, he owns a restaurant. And we were just talking, right? And then three of us were talking about the same thing, how we feel. And I was talking about my personal experience, how I, I feel a lot of things that stop me, my needing, that need to physically do work, sometimes stops my growth. For sure. Because I, I put my effort into dumb shit that I could easily outsource. This is what I tell Nick every day. Yeah. This is going to get real right now. So I've so been th- telling Nick he needs yeah. a Nick Jr., yeah, so we because it grow. stops me, right? Like I'm right. like I'm doing all these things. I'm physically doing these things myself, right? And then our other friend, she was like, "Dude, like all you guys are talking about, like she was like, you just gotta, you guys just gotta like own this shit and like be like, yeah, this is with you guys, like." And she, and she was like, "I don't know what what it is about the way you guys grew up or something." She was like, "I just fucking accept it. I'm just it, you know. This is just me." And I was like, "Fuck, I gotta, I gotta get on that level." Yeah. And she 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 was like, you know, we as managers have two jobs delegate and follow up and if you're doing anything else you're just wasting your time it's hard it, though. it's tough to relinquish ownership of it's something. tough to relinquish ownership yeah it is very especially when it's more creative like on your yes. end it's more creative mm-hmm. but i mean without systemizing things you're not going to be able to grow right because at the end of the day you have the same amount of time as everyone else and if that time is taken up by this task then that task is going to go unaccomplished yeah. or you're just going to maintain where you are Right. Right. Which, but that's another conversation where it's like in our community of like people who are doing stuff. Yeah. This is like when the first thing people ask you is like, oh, what are you up to? And you're like, oh, I'm doing this. They're like, oh, cool. What's new? What else? And I'm like, (laughs) fuck, now I got to have something else too. (laughs) That's always the question. It's always like, what, like, what's, what, what new thing are you working on? Yeah. Right. Right. And it's like, ah, like people are like, it's like the restaurant, the micheladas, the book, and people are, oh, okay, um, what else? What else? Yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. It's, <laughs> it's never good enough. Yeah. Nothing's ever good enough for anyone. Well, there's an expectation there, right? And then I don't know if it's like, a, like, it's not real though, right? Like nobody really expects you to like, people are, people, do. it's just a conversational thing. It's like yesterday I was on the, I get a phone call from a friend, hadn't spoken to them a while in, in a, like two years. And they're like, looks like you're killing it. Oh my God. All this exciting stuff. Love the podcast. Love the brewery. How's it all going? And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's your yeah, world. That's view? that exactly. Hmm. Yeah, because like, from the doesn't inside, feel like it. Yeah, I'm from the inside, right it doesn't here. look like that at all. <laughs> no, the day to day is very different. It's completely different. Yeah, and it's um. Anyway, we were talking about this last night at length, and it was kind of like how we cope with it, right? Like the seesaw of it all. How do you how, cope with it? So for me, what I was telling my buddy is, it, it there's two there's two things. One all the fears and the the fear of failure lives in my subconscious and particularly when I come out, when I sleep. Mm-hmm. And so then it just comes out. And for a long time, I was super good at ignoring it and blocking it out. I was so good at that. It was like all ego. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'd like plug into the ego and then it would just block it out. And it was just getting worse. And so at some point I just needed to talk to it, right? Yeah. And have the conversation and just accept it and be like, look, this is a normal thing. We're all going through it talking to other people, people like you, right, that are that feel it. And then you're like, oh, I'm not alone in this. How great, right? And so you're in a safe space with other people and just realizing it's just normal. It's part of it and um, embracing it to some extent. Basically not running away yeah. from it. Facing it's, it's, it. Yeah, facing well, it. That's kind of what I, I did. I just just doing right, and not worrying about the perfection or the looks of it. Yeah. The other thing is like momentum. So I try to keep momentum going. And then it's um, tiring. It's, it's tiring, but it's also... I've gotten, I think, pretty good at just hiring the experts, you know, not overthinking, hire the experts. And that's, yeah. I think that's why I like real estate development so much is because I, I literally can't be the lawyer. I can't be <laughs> the architect. 
I can't be the environmental assessment company. And so it forces me to rely on people to do their job. And at the same time, it's like, it makes me feel good. I'm employing people, but I'm also getting good counsel or yeah. good services. And so there's a whole component to, I think, real estate development where it also solves, solves the what's next because there's another project. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so it's like I figured out the construct of how to check the boxes. Do you have a end place? Do you have a place where you'll be comfortable stopping? So this is, so we talked about this last night too. For me, it, so everything goes back to the why you do it. The why. And, and, and it's not like, oh, because I like it. It's so fun. It's like, I love drinking. It's not, it's not that. Yeah. The why is like super personal to you. And so for me, I've just always really valued my time and being able to dictate my time. But you that's, can do that now. I mean, like, so that's a weird question, though, because it's, it's a weird because I, you know, I mean, you can do that very easily with very little. You can. And no doubt. Right. But if you want to grow your if you want to have kids, as an example, like there's a there's a fiscal responsibility you have to these individuals you want to bring into the world. And my whole thing is, how do I maximize my time with them without having a nine to five or without being in a chair all day? And that is the problem I've, I feel like I've solved. And so the question isn't, to me anyway, it, when is it enough? I have it now, mm -hmm. right? It's what changes around you that then requires a system to optimize to, let's say, two kids, three kids, no kids, right? And so it's always the balance. Yeah. And I think as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking, I want this, so let me optimize the system to get me that and sometimes it's just vanity sometimes people are like oh, i want the car They're yeah like, i want this mansion and so they work really hard to do that for me it's none of that it's just yeah. it's just my time it's like how do i maximize my time i'm trying to strip yeah when i got married i uh one of the things that changed inside of me i like i was like i gotta strip away all the wants inside of me yeah and just focus on like the realness like the communication the time time spent with people time spent being present yeah and like stop worrying about money in a weird way like you know but i'm still working a lot so it's not like right so i'm trying to figure out what my end thing is because right, right now you know we cut back and right now we're living on like so little money but still doing the same amount of things and still being happy and still doing all those things so we're just saving and saving and saving but why <laughs> why are you saving i don't know you see even this, <laughs> yes. I'm, sa I'm saving right now for like i want to i want to get into like real estate investing yeah so i'm, I'm saving capital got it because I'm trying to systemize my life where I can then get like the residual incomes and do all those things. Right. You're trying to create passive income for yourself. Exactly. Right. So you could have your time back. Yeah. Yeah. But I could even have my time back now. It's just like. But you require more. The system requires more. The yeah. life requires more. The family requires more. Yeah. But it never stops. Never stops. <laughs> it only gets worse. Yeah. Like your wife's not going to one day be like, oh, I want less time from you. <laughs> right. Or your kids or yeah. your family. Family needs change. I mean, you have a lot of siblings. Once they have kids, you know, then you have a nephew, nieces. Yeah, yeah. You want to spend time with them. That's what happened for me. I have two nephews. And all I want to do is make sure, like, I see them as much as I can. They're in Massachusetts. And so it goes back to the time equation. Systems here. Cool. I got to optimize so we can go back to the East Coast four times a year and be present, right? Be part of their lives. That's, like, important to me. It's an ever-evolving thing. It is. Yeah, yeah, there's some days where I fantasize about like moving to Ohio and homeschooling kids. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's- Don't go to Ohio. <laughs> just avoid it. I have friends of mine who are entrepreneurs that homeschool their kids. Yeah. And they've created that, like their own oasis. That There's lifestyle. a community. I mean, that's in any any city, any When city. I was younger, you know, like every, I think like everybody who went to public school, you would think homeschool kids are weird. Now, I'm, now I understand it more. I was talking to someone the other day about how in popular culture, having a good life and being stable and doing all these things was like looked down upon. Like, look at The Simpsons, right? Flanders is the punchline. He's like the punching bag. But he's the guy with the best life. He has like his kids who love him. He loves his wife. Yeah. He has a great relationship with, like, you know, with God if you're religious. Yeah. You know, he has it all. But he's the punching bag and he's like the loser. And Homer Simpson is the hero of the show. Well, yeah. It just depends on what makes you happy. If, if that makes you happy. Like, there are some people who are very content with just working their nine to five coming home to their family at you know 5 30 when they get off work and that's that's all they could ever want but then there's the other side of the equation which is the workaholics so to speak like they're never satisfied with with 
good enough. They always want that perfection. So then they strive and they add those extra hours to work for it. And I've noticed the disparity between myself and some of my friends who they were content to just go work for the government and start settling down, buying a house, having kids. And I was just never, I was never comfortable with that life, which is why I, I ran away from it and didn't pursue it. But for them, I don't, I don't hold anything against them for not wanting the same things I do. It's more, that's their life that makes them happy and gives them joy. So why not pursue that? It's a very achievable goal. No. Yeah. I mean, obviously we're all here, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like doing, I have like three, four jobs, but sometimes like the Flanders, I just go like in my mind, I go back to Flanders. It's a really interesting point that you're bringing up here because it's like, uh, like Flanders could be an entrepreneur, but, but like Mitt Romney, mm, let's right? talk about Mitt. I'm like he fan. is very much in pop in, in LA. It's like, he's like the boring punching bag and stuff, but aside from politics, yeah, like just looking at like lifestyle and stuff, the Mormon the mormon that that kind of like very he's, wealthy he's like a capital. saltine cracker yes yeah. no flavor no but that, taste but that's like that's like the that's a that's the that's, perception that's your flanders that's yeah. a perception but the difference with mitt that i feel like flanders does not have mitt <laughs> never has to work a day in his life and probably never did i'm he's, sure he does he's, he's a venture capitalist he's i mean it's different work right 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 he but he's got enough money where he could decide to never that's the do issue. anything again. So that's the issue. Yeah, back to that's the same. That's yeah. the issue. The issue is he has that. He has that, yet he's still out there in the pursuit of power. I mean, that's like some emptiness that, you know, anybody who goes into like that kind of level of politics. Yeah. You have that kind of need and emptiness inside of you. Right. For validation. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a trajectory. So, I mean, my friends talk about this too. It's kind of like, they, you know, they've sold their companies, they're doing super well. So now they have money and the only thing to attain now is power. Yeah. And so that's why they go into politics or screwing each other's like the friends. Basically, they screw each other over. And so on the real estate side, for me, I mean, any one of these guys, if I upset, could just easily be, be like, oh, let's make Diego's project a little <laughs> bit more, a little bit more difficult here. And, you know, you're susceptible to that. Um, lucky for me, I'm not I'm not competing with them. Right. I'm not yeah. the same age as them. And so they kind of look at me like a cute little nephew, which is nice for now. Yeah, but nice. I know at some point it'll change. And, you know, the competition will exist in the human nature. It'll come out and we'll deal with that when we'll deal with that. But it, it's strange. Yeah, I, yeah, man, it's a good conversation. Super, super interesting. We could have an entire podcast about this. Yeah, <laughs> and we should. I mean, this is like a lot of the stuff that doesn't get stated Um well, yeah, well, I think we're there. a lot of people don't like to have these conversations for some reason. No, I love it. Yeah. I really do. It's like a, the most exciting thing. It's the most authentic, right? It's the most you're like, yeah, it's like, it's like humanity. It's yeah. like what it, what makes us human? What makes us like, why keep going? Like literally, why not, you know, just stop or sell everything you have right now and just. Uh, so this, I think this is why. So I have I've had this conversation, too. So. I have this belief that the human being today is actually programmed to be a doer, a, a progress seeker. And there's nothing you can do to shut that off. And so the, this vision of people like, oh, I want to retire and be on the beach is really flawed, actually. Yeah. It's more of like an American it's an marketing. Advertising. It's just advertising, right? Because they got to sell condos yeah. in Florida. And that's totally cool. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the human being today is not programmed to do that. They're programmed to to build, to add another brick, except now it looks digital. And that's it. That's the I, game. I think that it's because like people, people's perception of reality is shaped only by um, comparison. Yeah, that's a fact. Too. You know, it's like we, I can give you a million dollars and you'll be happy. But as soon as you meet a friend with $2 million, you're like, oh, well, I want to have $2 million now. So this is what, so why I got into real estate. What I realized was there's a lot of people with a lot of money. What they don't know how to do is grow the money. Yeah. They have no idea. And so I tell people. Would you rather have a million dollars or know how to make a million dollars, right? And these are, some people choose the million. Mm -hmm. Totally reasonable. Kind of makes sense, actually. Yeah. Because growing it is actually very difficult. It's yeah. hard. It's like starting a business. And so I've just always focused on like, I need to, I'd rather know how to play the game than be accepted winning the game. Yeah. And I, and that's just been my thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an unwinnable game. Totally true. Yeah. I mean, you know, who would you say is winning right now? Oh man! Because you can always you can, anybody who brings you, up, you and gonna, it's a right answer no matter who you say. <laughs> yeah, it's well, it's a, yeah, right or wrong answer, right? Like yeah. it's just, there's no 
who let me you could say Bezos because he's the wealthiest man in the world, yeah. but you could be just as wrong too. Yeah, because you're like oh, that guy. He's like I don't, know, I don't know how happy he is, right? Right. Right. Is he? I is mean, he, is he hanging out with his nephews and nieces and probably not kids and, and stuff? It's to the. I mean, it's it's miserable, frankly. I mean, even Mark Zuckerberg, you can't take photos out in public. You can't. There's a whole security team. I mean, you're you and I use our laptops freely. He does not. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a whole nother world. It's yeah. just the level of security at his house, in his car, his cell phone. Everything is prone to be hacked at any moment. It's just a very, you can't trust anybody. Right? You could say something off the cuff and next thing you know, it's in the New York Times. Yeah. Even the smallest things become, you know, you, you make mountains out of molehills on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. My dad moved back to Oaxaca and the other day, you know, he's building this like compound. That he doesn't know what he's going to do with it, but he's just doing it because, you know, he has nothing to do. Yeah, it sounds like you're all wired that way. It's kind of <laughs> nice. He was like doing this thing and, um, you know, he was talking about like, what, what, is, what should the experience on it be? And I was like, well, like, how do you live? Because I feel like he has a life that everybody wishes they had. And he was like, well, you know, I wake up whenever. <laughs> you know, it's like his like, organic food that's grown locally. He eats yeah. his good food and he's in, in, in nature. He gets to like look up at the stars at night. But yet he's not he's not like all super happy with it right he's constantly worried about us and worried about the restaurant worried about like all these things that he has no control over and he doesn't understand what he has yeah so i was like you know just do that for your customers just have them live a life you life but without the baggage of you (laughs) that's a good point richard branson people ask him his daily routine and they find it amazing so he wakes up he has like a similar coffee Mm -hmm. plays tennis for two hours or an hour and then he does emails then he does another physical activity like surfing or like riding his bike on the island but in while he's doing all of that there's for sure levels of stress that are happening and he's doing these things to offset the to offset the stress yeah he's not like playing tennis because he wants his forehand to be at a (laughs) form you know and a part of that is totally awesome that he's doing that and he's probably is getting better at tennis but at the end of the day it's a cope it's all coping it's all coping you're just trying to so i was interviewed stephen colbert was getting interviewed by uh conan o'brien on his show like that flip interview thing he does yeah and uh the conan o'brien was like how do you deal with being in front of these people this adoration all day and you go home how do you turn it (laughs) off Because yeah. your wife, you know, like they're not, they're not fans. She's yeah. not gonna clap for you yeah, when you walk into the room. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, he's like, I'm just miserable when I'm home. I'm just like miserable to be around. <laughs> and Conor Bryan was like, me too. Everybody has these private lives. Alicia Keys posted this great video on her Instagram about when she was named the Grammy host, and her, I think she has like a young kids, like under four years old, and so they're running around. And she walks in, she's like, "Mommy has amazing news," and the kids are like. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Like they don't, they don't <laughs> I care. don't care. And then she tells them, she's like, oh, I'm going to be hosting the Grammys. And one of them's like, did you say grannies? <laughs> like what? Like doesn't care yeah. at all. You know, there's perspective in the moment. Yeah. For both ends of it. But at the same time, you know, I feel like this is this is what privilege sounds like. Us complaining about our existential issues. I guess so. But we all we all strive for something greater. We all crave a purpose. And what you find that in can either define you or shape your existence in this world and, yeah. and, and the impact that you have around those or the people around you. So yeah. some of us find it in the work that we do. Others find it in family. Where do you find your purpose? Creating. Creating. I, I love, for me, I love creating works that get some sort of emotional reaction from people. So whether that's a, a photo or a video or even just something mundane like in everyday life. But I love eliciting some sort of uh, emotion from people because I'm like, I, I help them find that spark of happiness. I, I help make them laugh. Like that's that's my drive. I like hearing stuff. Where do you find purpose? So, so two, right? One of the time is like really making sure that I can do what I want when I want and owning that. Progress is part of it. Doing cool stuff is part of it. Making money is part of it. But the other part of it is, again, it gets to like, I've just analyzed myself very deeply. And so I, I kind of know why I do the things I, I do. And so the other one is I grew up with no one. So we moved here from Peru and crazy, like leaving a, a somewhat a country going through some bad stuff. And so we came to Massachusetts and I never really had an example of someone who made it in America. I didn't have that because mm-hmm. we're new here. Right. So it's like, where do, I, where do you look? 
and you know your doctors and you know your whatever right yeah. but it's like you don't they're not your uncle yeah, yeah and so i can't talk to them and be like how did you make it yeah what are the steps what are the steps what's the process what what, what are the rules to this game we call the usa and for me i've at some point had a revelation where i'm like that's what i'm solving for myself and so if i have kids or nephews nieces and they're like oh uncle diego seemed to figure out let me go talk to him right you're gonna be like you guys are fucked <laughs> <laughs> and even if they don't want it at least they have the example at least yeah. they have someone in their life who's like ah oh, uncle diego did something cool let's talk to him yeah but there's other examples too now right we have doctors and other people doing cool stuff now you have a circle of friends that you can refer them to right and so i think that 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 for me is the is another part of the why it's the time but also trying to trying to live that trying to figure that out on the daily the perspective is there i mean i keep those things pretty clear but it's it's still not easy even having that right more beer i love one another more. one yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, this is that dark stout Oh, that's delicious. So we have like a Belgian chocolatey ale in front of us. And Fernando's about to add some of the Miche mix. Well, that's good. It's good, right? It's great yeah. beer. But it's like it's light. It's not, it's not as strong as I thought it, it would. It's a brewery coming soon. We're not going to mention any names. We're going to get in trouble. This underground stuff. And so you have a YouTube video dedicated to, to, to grabbing a beer, adding yeah, Miche mix to it. It's like this. We just talk for a while. Let's see it. Let's see it. Talk, Cheers. It. Cheers. I am I am very frightened for you. Micha mix. Oh, you, you can str- smell it right away. Strong. Still tastes good. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Still a winner. <laughs> it's still good. You know, I'm just thinking back to to my childhood and and how we would have. Where did you grow? Just, up? Uh, Maryland. Maryland. Yeah. So we we would have you know tacos with some regularity but so you would have like the hard shell tacos yeah exactly with, like, taco with the ground with the beef. powder and stuff yeah well so like but that's the thing i thought i knew i was like oh yeah i, I like mexican food but then <laughs> i i knew i knew nothing of of mexican food until i i started traveling and then i i came out here and now what i thought i knew was was not even scratching the surface but it was that going mainstream like you know it took a while and we, we talked about this with the margaritas before it does take that Let's make this kind of a watered down version and then introduce it to the masses. And then you can kind of introduce them to the more nuanced uh, dishes and, and aspects of that culture. I don't, I don't know. I don't, Cause this isn't a watered down version. No, no, no I'm not, I'm not talking about your Michelada. I'm just no, talking about it. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah. like my, you know, my, when, when I talk, when I tell people that I want to get into Applebee's, yeah. people laugh and they're like, why Applebee's? It's like, you know, you're going to get a, Applebee's. Well, Applebee's is like the most watered down version of but like, like Americana. But my my argument is like their I, fudge cake I can't, is good. Let's be honest, their what? fudge cake, their chocolate fudge cake. Well, I love their, their chocolate mold. Yeah, I get down with it. Hey. And also their buffalo wing, uh, boneless hey. buffalo wing bites Applebee's are dope. Applebee's is good. But like I always tell people, I can't help what they eat. But if I can make sure they have a good michelada, right? You want to be on the menu, man. Right. Yeah. Like I can't I can't help what you eat, but I can give you a good michelada. Yeah. You right? can give if, them the best experience yeah. that you can. Yeah. And this is an authentic michelada, but it's palatable. The, the brown one is more, because that's our, our original one. And I think the original story is that, so when I got into Shakey's, I got with the brown one. And I didn't I didn't have the red one. So then I got into the stores, they distributed it. The guy who got me in, he called me up. He was like, hey, friend, we're having troubles. People are ordering the michelada, but when they see it, they, mm. they send it back because it's not, what it, it's not what they imagine. And that's an LA problem. Because yeah. in LA, micheladas are red. Where in Mexico, they're darker. So then I was like, oh, you know, that's funny. I'm working on a, on a more red version right now, but I wasn't. So I hung up and I was like, hey, I got to work on this red version. So then by the week after, I dropped <laughs> oh, I off a sample that. that we came up with. And that's how we came up with the red. But the red is still a from the ground up mix. And actually, when, when, when we made it, I was like, fuck, I, even, I, I may even like this one more. But, you know, I go back and forth now. I mean, I think about this all the time when it relates to products. It's like you have a perception of what it should be. Yeah. And the perception messes with your with your ideal. You know, it's like someone who's never had good Peruvian food. Right. And they have some good Peruvian food. Right. They can have the best Peruvian food. And they're like, this is bad because it's not what they expect. Exactly. It's totally true. Would you ever consider branding this like a Mexican Bloody Mary? Like, would you use those terms? That's how that's how we use it with people who don't know. But I feel like if we do that, then uh, we, we mess around with perceptions. Yeah. And it, it's no longer a new market. And I feel like there's more upside to opening up a new market yeah. than to tag along to an existing market. 
But, but I mean, you explain it that way to somebody if they're like, "What the hell is a?" I, I, I use it. I, I always say it's like a Mexican bloody. It's like it's like a Mexican bloody mary with beer, but not quite it. It's not tomato. It's more citrusy. Right. And it's more savory. No vodka. No vodka. Just all beer. No bacon. You put bacon no bacon. In no burgers. <laughs> Some people go all out with it. You know, you go to like some of these restaurants. And I've been to a Mexican restaurant where they had a meatball. And you have like, like shrimp. They'll put the skewers on top. The skewers. So, some people even put like the whole can and they'll dip the entire beer can in chili powder. So it'll be a chili powder coated can, which is all show. It's also hard to carry, but some people like it. I'm like, oh. Some you know. people like the show of it. Uh, you know? Some people like the, the show, but that's more like at a restaurant experience. What is next for you guys in terms of growing the business? What's next? It's growing the Michelada, what? growing distribution. Okay. We're still self distribute So getting distribution and then getting distribution outside of state and then just growing the network so then we, it could just like... Have you thought about having Northgate as either a partner, investor? Well, North, Northgate, yeah, I would I would welcome, not Northgate, but like in Northgate executive. The someone, family, Someone yeah. with like experience, someone with connections and stuff like that. Side? Yeah. Uh, I'm open to like investors, but very particular. We have one investor. But okay. it's like a one percent, and okay. it's more of a relationship investment. It's a friend. It's a friend, but they have a big user base, and it's okay. uh, it makes sense. Got it. And the other, the only other person I have in mind, only two people. Yeah. One is like a Northgate person. Yep. And another person is like an influencer. Okay. So you know, a, a partner there will make sense because the long game would be to they expand your reach. Yeah, expand the reach and. What you know, is the long game? Is it to get acquired? What yeah, you... probably. I mean, I don't know. Either either acquire or if we if we are in the position to get acquired, see what what it's worth at that point and see if it's worth it or not. How far to the east coast of the United States do you? Do you we can sell? go all the way. You no, know? but in terms of accounts. Oh, uh, we have like one account in like Florida, one account in Georgia, one account in New okay. York. It's like that. It's peppered. Okay. But because the thing is, because we're self distributed. Any account that's not through a distributor is additional work. Right. So right now we're trying to be as lean as possible. So we're trying to uh, wait for that other accounts. Ideal, I like to uh, unload them onto a distributor yeah. rather than like us do all the work. So besides that, what else is uh, on the 2020 agenda? 2020, honestly, I'm trying to actively stay away from opportunities what does because that mean? we'd like to more focus on the things we have on the table. Okay. Like the restaurant, the book, uh, we have a, we, we're building houses in Oaxaca. that are like Airbnb hotels. So like, for example, I meet, I don't know, someone really cool. Me, I want to go. I'm like, yo, dude, so, say you have, you He's have. He's like, not you, Diego. No, you're no, not, yeah. You're not that cool. Well, obviously you. <laughs> but I'm saying like, right, like you obviously, but like, say, say I meet someone, they have uh, 50 million followers on Instagram. Yeah. You want to do some kind of media. I'm like, hey, dude, let's go to Oaxaca. I'll, I'll put you up. I see. And we'll hang out, you know, because obviously we want to get back to the state. And the best way to get back to the state is to convince people to go down there and spend their money with the people that actually make things. And then past that, like if I ever, you know, I have dreams of like if I ever. What are your dreams? Sell this off. I like to open up a brewery. I worked a lot with breweries now and I've talked to a lot of brewers. Yeah. And more importantly, I've talked to a lot of failed brewers. Yeah. So I feel like now I have a better idea. What what have you learned from, from them? From failed brewers? Yeah. I learned that breweries are restaurants. And if you don't operate them as restaurants, you're doomed to fail. What does that mean? Uh, in terms of your margins. Yeah. In terms of uh, your profit margins, your costs, your cost structure, that you can't depend on outside distribution and success. I've learned that. And then um, if you don't engage the community, that's a surefire way to die. Same thing as a restaurant. Whether it's local artists or just being present. With the community it's just being present, meetings. just being there, saying hi to people, being known. I mean, if you treat it as a local restaurant. I just describe this as like, just give a shit. That's kind yeah, of the motto. Yeah, I mean, it's any like, business. Give a shit, right? And if you don't, people will know and you'll fail. Yeah. And it's no secret. I'd love, to, I'd love to um, do Michamobil, like Michamobil concepts at like the Why airport. Why don't you just do it now? That that uh, I, I would be more open to it now. Why don't you because just do it the brewery now? I'm curious. What's holding you back? Because I want to focus on the Micheladas right now. I like I I I'm very easily me personally. Yeah. My attention very easily gets drawn, and like I feel like if I if I try to do that or try to do anything else, my attention will will be sucked away from the Micheladas. But it's all vertically integrated in some way, right? Not, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, but not really. Okay. Because it's, it's it takes time. It does. I mean, I I feel like maybe if I get better at being a delegator. Yeah. And I can hire away my position at Micheladas. Yeah. Then I can do it. 
Sounds like you have something on your to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> this is we'll something Nick and I talk about all the time. You got to build the system basically to yeah. allow that. And then, and then oh, that's what I'm working on right now. Right now it's just like, I mean, we're a startup. Yeah. You know, we're a startup. So we're just bootstrapping. I'm just, everything is staying inside. I'm hiring good people. And once I get like the distribution and the, the sales and all that stuff, then I can systemize everything. But I need the sales because right now, right, you need the sales. Right now, it's just justify. maintaining. Right, right, right. Right now, it's maintaining. Yeah, any growth numbers. But if I can hit that by mid next year, then you know, I mean, every year it gets better. Every year we do more sales. Yeah. Every year we get bigger. I mean, you know, when we started, I used to like look at the competition and be like, "Damn, how do they do that?" Now we're doing the same numbers as they do. Now I just need more accounts, but I need distributors and I need like the footprints. And then, you know, because marketing, all the marketing, all that stuff is ingrained in who we are. Yeah. I think that's the most beautiful part because you're not, you're not creating a brand per se, right? You're yeah. Not, you're, I feel like we're a brand guys. creating a product. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is, is really difficult. Yeah. Right. It's like, imagine three of us were to pick a product today. Let's call it candles. Yeah. We don't know shit about candles, but like we pick a look. Yeah. Kind of like the whole garbage disposal. We'd yeah. Be like, let's make it look this way. Let's brand it this way. You guys are the complete opposite. You're just sharing your culture. Yeah. And your passion. Yeah. I mean, Michelas, Michelas are, I'm, I'm bicultural, right? I'm Oaxaca, but I'm LA. Yeah. The Michelas is my LA side. And the restaurant is my Oaxacan side. I so like, like the Michelas brand is like a cool, hanging out in LA. Backyard parties, palm trees, Michelmobile. Tell everyone where they can find you. They can and find me on Instagram at LearnandoFopez. No, just at LearnandoFopez. And then I love Micheladas. I, I love Micheladas at Smorgasburg, LA, every Sunday uh, at La Gilaguetza. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me. Thanks yeah, for being thank on you for coming on. This is surprisingly good that Michelada brought out, like, the, the it, chocolate really brought out the spice. It's good. It yeah. is good, yeah. It's grown on me. <laughs> he's, he's like, yeah. Cheers. We here at Start at the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think about the show. Make sure to give us a rating on iTunes. Anything over five stars is the only way to go. Our music is composed by Double Touch. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Start Up the Storefront. For more information on the products and businesses featured on the show, check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.